Welcome again, everyone, to the European Society of Biomechanics webinar series in collaboration today with the VPH Institute. So, Moshtaba from the VPH Student Committee and I will be chairing today's uh, webinar. Today, we are going to listen to a lecture about the software Phoenix and its application to the glymphatic system modeling. The presentation will be around 45 minutes followed by 50 minutes of Q&A session. So either during the talk or after the talk, please type in your questions in the chat box uh, or in the question box so that we can collect them and go through them afterwards. Before starting, I would like just to remind you that all the webinars from the ESP are uploaded on the ESP YouTube channel. Here you can find also other recordings, for example, from uh, award presentations or plenary lectures, or also from the journal club sessions. So I would like to encourage you all to subscribe to uh, get to know more the activities happening within the ESP. So let's go back to today's webinar. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Prof. Kent Mardal. Uh, he has been a core developer for uh, the open source software framework Phoenix. He is a mathematician with a strong interest in biomedical applications. He is currently a professor in mechanics at the University of Oslo, an adjunct research scientist at Simula Research Laboratory, and also a consultant for expert analytics. So without any uh, further ado, I um, would like to give you the possibility to share your screen. Okay, here we go. So um, the stage is yours and we are very eager to listen to your talk. Thank you. Uh, you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. So everything is fine. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I realize now that my title of this talk is slightly different from what was mentioned there in the in the beginning. So, but it's it is about um, uh, this topic. And let me see if I um, and like uh, Mustaba, he told me that I shouldn't go very deeply into the. Uh, multi-physics problems related to this uh, this uh, problem and rather focus on soft some software aspects and what we have been doing on, on that topic so this is what I'm gonna gonna do but before I do that I'm gonna uh, sort of try to explain a little bit of why we are doing this like uh, the application uh, which specifically targets sleep and then to what extent this uh, this uh, processes that we are discussing here can be modeled and are interesting for disease development uh, like alzheimer's and so on and i'm going to stress here in the beginning as well that always it is the case that we're going to have to look at quite complicated geometries like here we have the brain like it looks on the macro scale you could say this is a decimeter scale uh, this is a healthy brain, whereas on the right here you have a brain with Alzheimer. Uh, if you zoom in, we have the blood vessels here. In all kinds of diseases, you will see that they change. Like this looks like a quite messy uh, blood vessel structure, but actually it's quite structured. So this is almost space filling and so on. And then we have can even zoom in further and you see that this is uh, what well, this is on the millimeter scale this is on a micrometer scale this is the extracellular matrix and it looks quite messy so whenever we are working with this we need computational tools that are capable of, of dealing with the complex geometries that we are we dealing with and so i'm going to touch a little bit on that, but I'm not going into the high performance uh, computing uh, aspects of it in this talk. And also I'm only going to consider very simple models. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, sleep and why we are so fascinated about this topic. 
And then I'm going to talk about these Phoenix tools uh, for this uh, application uh, later on. Um, um, but if we talk about sleep, so it's fascinating, right? Because all animal sleeps, like you can say ants, jellyfish, mammals, human, and so on, we all of us will spend roughly a third of our lives uh, sleeping. This this is obvious to us, but it's also kind of strange. Um, and this sleep or the circadian rhythm, that means the 24 hour rhythm that we have uh, in our body is, is really uh, hard coded in us. Like you can identify it even in individual cells, like in the heart cells and so on. It has been tested to what extent it's uh, uh, sensitive to this. Of course, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense to save energy and so on. So a circadian rhythm makes sense. However, the, the thing that is really hard to explain in my mind is the fact that we need to become unconscious. So we are definitely not able to protect ourselves get food or uh, mate or whatever during this uh, phase, right? So it's a very, very obvious disadvantage. And since it's uh, a very, very obvious disadvantage, it, it has to have some advantages. Sleep is absolutely required. We die without it. And there are many creative solutions uh, in nature, like Birds are sleeping with half a brain, uh, one half at a time, the same uh, with fishes and, and so on. So it's really hard coded uh, into us and nature really have found like stupid or creative solution like sleeping with half of the brain as a solution to get around this. Now I'm going to just show you a movie of what happens uh, during sleep. Um, so this is, here we are assuming if we look at the top, this is a mouse that is underneath the microscope. Uh, part of the skull has been uh, taken off. You can either shave it off if you don't want to perturb the system so that uh, it becomes uh, transparent or you can uh, drill a hole basically. And what we look in, we look here at a blood vessel in red, and we look at the astrocytes uh, in green. Astrocytes are the uh, cells of the brain that is not involved in thinking, but it's involved in regulating the environment. So there are about as many astrocytes, glia cells in the brain as neurons, and they are really regulating and enablers of, of for, for the excitable uh, neurons probably so what we are going to see here is that this mouse is sleeping so this is non REM some uh, sleep here in the beginning and we are going to have a look at what happens then on this uh, vessel here in this vessel we can identify the the blood it's in red perivascular space that is the space that I will be talking a lot about is in black here. And then you have astrocytes in green uh, in front of it. And what we will see here is a speed up of this uh, sleeping phase of, of the mice. The mice, uh, mice doesn't sleep in the same way as we do. They sleep in shorter periods and so on. But still they have like uh, roughly eight hours uh, for 24 hours. So I'm just going to play this movie now. So what we saw here was def sorry, what we saw here was definitely that the blood vessel is shrinking and increasing at uh, frequencies that are a lot slower than the cardiac frequency. So for um, a mice, a, a mouse, I mean, uh, the the cardiac frequency is typically 
they, they have 10 beats per second, uh, so 10 times uh, faster than us. And these cycles, you can typically identify like uh, 10 hertz or something. So it's 100 times slower than the cardiac frequency. Now, why are we doing this when we are sleeping is then the question. This is really the question that we uh, look into. So the and the reason or, or the new theory here uh, that concerns this is called the glymphatic system. And this is a kind of a crowded uh, slide here, so I'm going to walk you through it. Here we have a blood vessel. It starts at the surface of the brain and then it enters into the brain here. So this is an artery. Surrounding this artery is a space that is called the perivascular space. It was what we identified as this black area here in the previous uh, previous movie. And it's this specific cavity that we are interested in. So because this has a very close relationship with the cerebrospinal fluid. And so the glymphatic theory, it tells us that there is a parallel uh, flow system in the brain that runs in parallel with the blood vessels, drives flow from the arterial side through the brain, through the interstitium here, as, which is, you can think of as a porous medium, and then out on the venous side. So this is then believed to be responsible for clearing whatever waste there is in the brain. And uh, waste that uh, could be like amyloid, beta, and so on, that is associated with uh, Alzheimer's physics, no, Alzheimer's disease, I mean. So we have a new system. It was uh, described first in 2012 or 2013. It has uh, gained a lot of um, attention uh, after this. It's called the glymphatic system because uh, different from the rest of the uh, body the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system it only has this system and the lymphatic system in the rest of our body is responsible for removing waste what what they found in this study was that um, uh, things were happening a lot faster during sleep so this is uh, a piece of tissue, like much similar to what we saw actually on this movie. You have blood vessels here, uh, several of them. This is a 200 micron cube. So this is smaller than one millimeter, right? And um, one fifth of a millimeter. In green here, what we see then is how the tracer distributes itself into the tissue. Uh, during uh, sleep, whereas in awake condition, it's what happens during uh, when when the mouse is is awake. So, if we summarize, let's say what is going on 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 the uh, in a time series like this, we see that this spread of tracer is let's say ten times faster in sleep than it is in awake condition. So this is kind of interesting. Um, what, how we look at it, we try to do this also in humans. So uh, in humans, what uh, it it will look uh, look a little bit differently. So the water that surrounds the brain is here shown. I mean, it surrounds the brain. It's also internal in the brain. Here is the ventricular system shown in blue. And there's a, then interaction between this system here and the brain because, as you see here, this, this outside system is sort of in yellow and then there will be a pumping mechanism like a washing machine where the water that is here or the cerebral spinal fluid will go in and out of the brain. This is a simulation, uh, poor elastic simulation where we look at the pressure inside and outside of the brain. In this example, we have uh, solved this with a BO-type model, so poor elastic deformations. 
And then uh, I'm going to just briefly go through uh, some of the things that we have found in this aspect, because I think that this, this uh, theory here is in need of more modelers. So this is in some sense a call for help on this matter, because what I want to say is that we, we don't have the proper solution to this yet. We don't actually know what is going on. Uh, first of all, we tried with some microscopic uh, models. So this is um, this uh, piece of uh, a mouse brain that is five microns roughly. The mesh is uh, 50 to 80 million cells. So it's a big but not crazy big mesh, you could say. Uh, these meshes are available. I, I, I thought I would put it on Sunudu or something. I haven't actually done it, but I, I should definitely do that. What we did here was to solve Stokes uh, on this uh, problem, on this uh, geometry, with some uh, pressure gradient from one side to the other. The pressure gradient was roughly one millimeter of mercury. Probably, or maybe this one millimeter of mercury doesn't mean too much to you, but it's like on that scale that pulsations and so on are happening already in the brain. Maybe this is a little bit too big, but at least it's it's on the scale. We do Stokes type of simulations on this with Phoenix. It takes about 500 uh, CPU hours or three, three hours in real time. What we find here is that actually there's something uh, strange because the velocities that we are getting are a hundred times slower than sort of what we expect from the theory. And also the permeability is uh, a lot smaller than, than we were e expecting. So it seems that diffusion really dominates here rather than uh, convective flow. So if you summarize this theory that we saw earlier here, you can really uh, ask the question, is it convective flow here? Now, other studies have also come after this, um, sort of making this um, uh, problem even more complicated. So to what extent this is, there is uh, convective flow uh, there or not, we have to put a question uh, mark uh, to it because it's maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's it's not given at least. It's not clear at this point. Then we can discuss the other part. So if we look at this, we see the flow beside the vessel. Right here, you see the vessel, and then you have the flow that is coming past uh, the, of the cerebrospinal fluid or the water that comes uh, in this paravascular space. Now, in the theory that I presented in this glymphatic theory, it's supposed to be arterial pulsations that drive this flow. And of course, if we look closely at the movie here, I can actually identify the pulsations. So I can quantify the size of these pulsations and so on, uh, and try to determine whether the, these particles are uh, flowing um, like this because of the pulsations in, in, in the artery here. This is sort of what we have tried to do. And we found that, well, we cannot really get these flows without a, a netto pressure gradient and so on. I will not go into the details of these pressures here. I can go back to it later on if, if you ask me about it. But uh, we, have, we have gone in some detail through the pressures here in order to, to really try to quantify uh, what are the natural pressures in various papers. So summing up here, also we are not really able to explain what is going on in these experiments by uh, in this perivascular space with the current uh, theory that we, we have available. So there is something in the experiments that we cannot really explain by the theory. So 
of course then we can go on with even more experiments so these are experiments that are done here in oslo by our collaborators at Rikshospitalet. what you see here is a regular mri image i'm going to talk more about mri actually in this talk um, this is a standard t1 weighted image then they put in some contrast uh, into the lumbar region um, and then they see how it penetrates into the cerebral spinal fluid and also eventually into the brain so here it starts to fill out the cavities the ventricle system and so on whereas this is one hour after and so uh, further on, eight hours after, it starts to penetrate into the brain. Then the day after, it's basically everywhere. And then two days after, it uh, diminishes the signal here and a uh, week or some, something after that, or, or at least four weeks after, it's completely gone. So this process here seems to happen faster than what we can predict by the theory. So there is something with this theory that is, is strange. I try to summarize this in some very brief uh, analytical uh, considerations down here. We have also done this in a, a group of patients. Some were sleeping, some were not supposed to sleep during that night so they were in the hospital they were told to not sleep throughout the night and they were watched so they are sleep deprived uh, we can see similar system similar signal here we have colored it uh, basically you see that uh, after a certain period so this is the day after uh, you see that it penetrates the signal is almost everywhere except that it's not in the interior uh, if we summarize on the group level here we have signal for instance in the frontal cortex where we see how this uh, tracer is entering into the brain they they get this injection in the morning then uh, this is the last time point of the day, so uh, four to eight hours roughly. Then they, this group here is allowed to sleep, whereas this one, this group is not allowed to sleep. So definitely see a difference. Whereas the next day, it seems that the slope is fairly parallel. So there is something um, happening, but also uh, changes persist even 48 it should be 48 uh, up there 48 hours after uh, this uh, injection so in order to uh, uh, go further with this we try to develop some new models and i just gonna explain it very very briefly be before i start with the tools that we are using for this so we what we want to do is to represent the brain here as a poor elastic medium in the brain there's a bunch of vessels and so on and they are represented with um, a viscous flow and then you have the vessel wall that are poor elastic you have a fluid filled perivascular space that surrounds it that also have uh, a wall you can say attached to it perhaps not a vessel wall but uh, you can call it astrocytic end feet uh, or something like that so we really want to go to more fancy models with a poor elasticity coupled to uh, viscous flow in these various compartments Okay, now I'm going to shift gears a bit. I'm going to talk about this book that we uh, just published, actually. Uh, so this book uh, is for enabling uh, simulations like, like, like this uh, on human uh, brains, uh, where uh, we 
typically assume that you have data uh, from an MRI, MRI scan. So typically T1 T1 weighted data. I'm going to go through it. But actually, also together with this book, there is data. If you are in need of data, you can find data associated with this. So I'm going to go just uh, briefly now through the different aspects of this book because um, I was told sort of to make this uh, presentation like a little bit technical, a little bit on the Phoenix side side of it. So just to uh, start, uh, you can find the data set with the MRI images and so on. Uh, if you want, it, it's, it can be found here. So uh, if you want to play around with it, please, uh, please play. Um, also, the scripts and so on can be found uh, here. So first of all, we have uh, a tool, Free Surfer, is it's called, that is made for analyzing human brains. So, and specifically, it's uh, created for analyzing human brains based on T1 weighted images. You can also include things like T2 and so on, but it will make surfaces like we see here. It makes the surfaces based on a T1 image. So it's, it, it is a collection of various tools that you can use either from the command line or you have also some graphical user interfaces to do it. This is an illustration of, of the tool Freeview then that uh, after you sort of uh, run an initial uh, commands with the free server, it, it will typically take uh, several hours to analyze the brain and after you have analyzed it you can uh, have a look at it with with this tool so this is an open source tool that um, you can find also this is not associated with free uh, with phoenix but it's a separate uh, tool so the starting point is is MRI images. So here you see a T1 weighted image here on the left, and you have a T2 weighted image on the right. I will not go into what it means that it's T1 images or T2 images, but these are uh, protocols that the uh, MRI uh, physicians they will sort of uh, put in some some. Uh, protocols for this uh, this magnet to to that that will create these images what is clear from the t1 weighted image is that you have very clear contrast between the gray matter here as we see here and the white matter this is actually why it's called gray matter and white matter it's because on a t one weighted image it looks like gray matter and uh, white matter it doesn't look like that in in reality it it, it only looks like that on t1 weighted image but anyway you can definitely see the contrast between this uh, very clearly here and of course as we all know uh, the gray matter is basically where we're where we are thinking whereas the white matter is then the cables between uh, the thinking nodes you can say the t2 image is uh, better at showing the water we see quite sharp contrast between the water or the cerebrospinal fluid and the, and the brain here so together uh, these two images can be used and and uh, with this we create a surface so uh, from the surface you can make uh, meshes it's quite simple you can here we see a couple of different surfaces you say uh, target the resolution uh, of of the mesh uh, and obtain it so this is a coarse resolution of course and this is a, a better resolution um of course it's not always easy to create 
it is because there are many different uh, brains like some some are missing half of the brain or like uh, have uh, yeah so th the patients they will look may look quite different so this is a brain like a rough uh, segmentation of the brain you will see that the, it's a bit rough and you can say that okay i'm then gonna apply some smoothing to it and this is what we have done to get the rightmost uh, or, or this uh, middle image here we have performed a smoothing operation to get this uh, brain here we have also done it here so if you there are different types of smoothing so if you use a La, uh, laplacian uh, smoother then you might lose structures and volume actually so if you run it many many times actually what you obtain would be uh, basically nothing so the the brain is is shrinking whereas this tabin uh, smoothing it uh, preserves or at least roughly preserves the volume so it will not shrink and you see that this is uh, preserved things in a better, better way the surface of the brain is uh, roughly five times that it would be if it were a ball. So a ball with a corresponding radius and so on have uh, five times or roughly five times smaller surface area than, than our brain. Uh, so it's very wrinkly. So just some, some snippets from, from the from the book here really show that you can uh, import this uh, brain and play around with it with uh, different type of smoothing operations until you are satisfied with, with that. Um, also other tools like if, if we look at the brain here, uh, you might end up in, in trouble in, in different places. So free surfer is not necessarily a tool that is focused on creating brain meshes. It's focused on creating surfaces. And it's not a problem for them is if the surfaces are intersecting or things like that. It can, it can still be used for uh, statistical purposes. So what we see here is that in some cases, these um junctions there are are rather tight right perhaps some of them like this one is is fine whereas this guy over here is is very very tight so we can say that depending on the re resolution of the mesh we want that the, all of the junctions they will be bigger than this or that uh, basically because if they are not the 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 mesh cells they they might overlap or collide or something so for instance this is what we have done over here we have ensured that all of the junctions they are of a certain size if they are already were of a certain size then it's fine here it's uh, they needed to expand a little bit so code examples for for fixing things like this is uh, okay so here I have an STL surface. STL is a default uh, format that you obtain from from FreeSurfer. You can fill holes and so on. So make sure that it's uh, this because STL is not a very good uh, format actually. So you can have several triangles that are on top of each other, or they have a small. A hole in between it that you don't really notice, but that uh, creates trouble when when you try to mesh it. So you need to fill the holes, and you can also ensure that uh, the gaps are of a certain size. What you get out of the surfer is that it, based on some templates or atlases, it will segment the brain in different parts. So. For instance, uh, around here you have the insula, for instance, down here you have hippocampus and so on. So these are areas that are uh, of interest to neuroscientists and that you can um, deal with them 
and you get them segmented uh, through pre-surfer and you can uh, pull out quantities that are associated with with certain areas then um, after the simulation of course what what is here in the free surfer is a mesh of a certain resolution and then after you transform it into phoenix you might not get exactly the same resolution so depending on what you're choosing so here you see some jagged elements and so on 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 this uh, action so you can of course target the resolution of this uh, yourself but the more elements the final resolution you have on all of these different pieces of course the the more challenging it is to uh, solve problems on it afterwards so you can also find the free surfer tool uh, on, on github uh, if you if you're looking for it what we do also in 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 this book is that we describe uh, for instance how to include other modalities than just the, just the t1 and t2 that describes the geometry so you can get different type of physical quantities out of the mri measurements uh, by different protocols so diffusion tensor imaging tells you basically how a uh, water molecule at a certain place diffuses so for instance a water molecule up here will move differently from a water molecule down here and this diffusion tensor imaging um, uh, image is a three by three tensor in every point typically it ha will have different resolution than what you have in um, t1 and t2 and also this what this tensor does is that it characterizes the diffusion properties in different di directions so for in, in the white matter it will be anisotropic diffusion what is very popular is also to visualize the uh, diffusion tensor or the uh, eigenvectors of it uh, as as paths so what you see here are connections that are um, computed by uh, by looking at the eigen eigenvectors of the dominating eigen uh, values in order to connect different nodes in the brain so for instance you see that this guy over here is then connected the brain cells or, or the part of the gray matter over here is then connected to to some parts over here so we you can also get in uh, these type of modalities in into 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 phoenix so um just an overview of all of the tools here you can see that okay uh, we include both t1 t2 and dti probably in the future we will also talk about other modalities as well that can be included and we go through like how to convert it uh, and, and read it for instance into knee bubble or something like that so that you can have access to it in python um, and also how to deal with the surface uh, domains and so on So uh, back to the uh, problem, I've now um, uh, talked quite a bit about uh, also the tools that, that they will enable you to at least uh, address part of the questions that are associated with uh, this lymphatic system. So I just want to uh, just um, go briefly a little bit back to uh, the the strange things that that motivate uh, this uh, system so just some basic facts about the brain it occupies one to two percent of the body in volume or weight so let's say one and a half kilo something 
but then it consumes 10 to 20 percent of the body's uh, energy oxygen and so on so this our brain is a very 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 expensive organ 10 times more expensive than per, per volume than all of the things in our body elsewhere in our body we have a lymphatic system so you see it in green here uh, there's lots of lymphs, uh, lymph nodes and the lymphatic system is, is basically everywhere. It uh, is responsible for waste clearance. You can even see that it is in the cranium, right? So it's quite close to the brain, but it's not on the brain. So this, this is the enigma. This is the big question, right? It could definitely have been in the brain if if it wanted to, but it, it, it's not allowed to play a part in the brain. And since we have this massive uh, consumption of energy and waste production correspondingly, of course, there have to be a system that is, let's say, 10, ten times as, uh, uh, as efficient uh, as, as in the rest of the body, because it, it consumes 10 times as much. So this begs the question. And the, the final thing then is that this, uh, the brain, different from um, other things in our body, is surrounded by this uh, fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, that we see in blue down here. So this has to be, or it probably is uh, connected to waste clearance, is, is, is then the theory. Uh, it is important, uh, the hallmark feature of Alzheimer's, the Parkinson's disease and so on, is accumulation of meta metabolic waste in the brain. So this would be amyloid beta, CSF tau and so on. Of course, it's also important because these uh, dimensional type of diseases are diseases that develop slowly over decades. And any sense of treatment that sort of might perturb this, perhaps even early on, might significantly change the course of, of what is going on. So I think it's important and very little uh, effort is, is spent uh, on this by the community, computational or biomechanics com community. Cost, I read that cost is about 1% um, of the G GDP in Europe. Brain diseases are definitely uh, associated with uh, sleeping disorders. So, all of the pieces of these puzzles are in some sense here, and uh, we should uh, definitely have a closer look at it. I just end with some uh, cheesy uh, quotes uh, about sleep. Uh, sleep is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. Thomas Decker. I love sleep. I love sleep. It's my favorite. Can I rest? Um, I also like this last one of uh, John Steinbeck. It's a common experience that a problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the committee of sleep has worked on it. So this is my conclusion. Um, there is a need for more modeling on this topic. Uh, uh, definitely computational modeling and so on. And because there are numbers and so on, this theory doesn't really add up as there, as there is now. And uh, there are a lot of tools like FreeSurfer and Phoenix that enable uh, quite uh, interesting computational modeling, I would say. That was it. Thank you very much. I thought I had some acknowledgement here, but then I uh, didn't put it in actually. Okay. Thank you very much, Kent, for your impressive work. And um, 
I don't see uh, at the moment questions in the chat, but please, uh, if you have any question, just type in in the question box so that we can uh, go through them together with Ken. Um, I actually have a question uh, for you. So um, you show us uh, how to um, develop the geometry and uh, mesh it through uh, free surfer. Uh, and then, you know, I guess, importing to Phoenix. But is it possible to use in Phoenix geometries reconstructed uh, with other softwares uh, or meshed through other softwares? So how does it work, the um, coupling between FreeSurfer and Phoenix? I think here, like uh, like what what we have uh, here was that we had to uh, export the domain markers and also perhaps play a little bit with the uh, mesh and so on in order for it to to work properly. But there is this two mesh I/O that enable if you have already a working mesh, uh, you can definitely uh, export it like between many different formats with mesh I/O. Um, in this context, we also have to make the mesh, right? So uh, this this is a little bit uh, of the part of the problem here as well. Yeah, and I guess also. The but I guess that these tools that we are, have been making here, it's not necessarily tied to Phoenix, although it is now, right? But exporting these uh, tools to other software should be quite uh, quite possible. Uh, I believe it's nothing really um, that ties us strongly to Phoenix in this setting. Thank you. We have a message from uh, the audience else. This part said thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Mostaba, if you have. Yeah, I can uh, take over and ask a couple of questions. So, thank you so much, Kent, for this very impressive work. I got really impressed by the things that you showed, although, yeah, uh, I think the people who were here, they knew that uh, actually how difficult it was to build these models. And I have actually a couple of questions about uh, first mesh generation and then the computational model that you had built. Um, but before that, I should say that the book that you showed was very nice and was amazing, especially the workflow that you, you, you showed, like for the mesh generation. And then um, bef before that, image analysis, mesh generation, conversion, and the computational uh, model built up. So I, for sure, I will check out. Uh, the book and the source code shared on GitHub. And the first question for me is related to the micro scale model that you said it has around 80 million elements. So you have used this, uh, as you showed, this SVMTK tool to generate such a mesh or something else? Because I think building such a mesh is very difficult actually. Uh, so in that uh, we actually did uh, use a precursor of uh, SVMTK actually to build this. Uh, so this was a different tool actually. But uh, just to say this, uh, like uh, it's um, uh, let's say 80 million mesh uh, uh, the, the cells in the mesh, but it's not the same amount of vertices in the mesh, right? So this this is maybe like uh, 10 million or something like that. So there mm -hmm. are fewer uh, vertices than uh, cells in a typical 3D mesh. Not necessarily order 10, but like around there. So making meshes with uh, um, it, you need maybe a powerful computer, but it's not crazy to do uh, mesh generation like that. That's, that is uh, possible, I would say, on powerful computer. Uh, as for the, you also commented on the pipeline and that uh, that kind of stuff. So, what we really want to, of course, is to run 
not only one patient or two patients or three or something, but let's say I want to just run through 300 or 1,000 or 100,000 patients with some simulations. I mean, they are already running through many, many patients with uh, image analysis and so on. And this perhaps can give us the opportunity to run simulation-based analysis on groups of, uh, we are aiming for a moderate size, like let's say hundreds or something like that. And then we have to script everything. We cannot sort of uh, run uh, like uh, uh, one one and one. We have to say that, okay, we, we run to, through a bunch. Yeah, okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, we have actually a, another comment here. Before I go to the next question that I have, it's uh, from Selena. She has said that I would uh, be very keen to hear more details about the development in Phoenix of more complex models. So, uh, and I think for, for that, uh, she can check out uh, your website. Uh, because I guess most of the, your models that you have developed, you have also shared the source codes, Phoenix source code, and people can uh, check them out. No, Ken? Yeah, so we uh, we have uh, we sh we typically try to share source code of. Uh, uh, so you can say that we have mixed type of uh, development. I mean, we have more advanced models that we run for just a few patients or uh, things like that. And then we have these simple models that we run for a bunch of patients. But we definitely, uh, if you look at some of our papers on, let's say, uh, coupling of BO Stokes or whatever, then then we have uh, shared code on that, that if you go to my webpage or something like that and click on the specific papers, you can find corresponding codes. And if you don't find a code, then you should ask us about about that. Okay, cool. So, Selena, if you have uh, further questions, please make sure to write a follow-up question. But uh, I can also ask uh, again, uh, you know, another question related to the question that I asked, and it is uh, like for this SVMTK tool, I found it quite, I didn't know about it. I found it quite cool because it had a lot of it has a lot of features that other tools provide. For example, I myself I use MeshLab for these purposes for surface reconstruction for filling holes and stuff. And then my question is: Is this is this uh, like I mean for SVMTK? Is this something that we can use for a general general usage of mesh repair operations, or this is a specific for this kind of brain models? This is something that I didn't get. I mean, SVMTK is built on top of Seagull, so, uh, and Seagull is a more uh, general purpose tool. But like there, there is this uh, thing that uh, in, in this, uh, we, we don't only need to deal with the uh, meshing, right? But we, we have to export that on this part of the domain, we want certain boundary conditions. In other parts, we want other boundary conditions in the domain we want this region to be marked and so on so it's about uh, I, i'd say that there are many different uh, meshing tools that are perfectly capable of, of doing just the same as svmt svmtk definitely because it's built on top of, of seagull for instance but you have to hold on to the markers of various things throughout the system. That's the need. Uh, and if you have a need for that, then uh, probably in different applications and so on, you can use it. But we really want to track uh, these markers uh, through the system. Um, and for meshing tools, you, you not, you're not necessarily having that. That's the yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, actually the figures that you, you showed reminded me of Seagal and so it's nice to know this SVMTK is actually based on Seagal because uh, yeah, so I, I should definitely check it out and I think 
can be also very interesting for other people seeing um, uh, this webinar live or seeing its recording later. And then uh, since we don't have a question showing up yet, I can also go for another one. Uh, Chair, if you don't have any question, I can go for my last one. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> for the computational model, again, related to the mesh, but more towards the Phoenix part, you showed a model that had different components or different domains as you had denoted, like from omega 1 to omega 9. And all those really some subdomains of the computational model you have implemented in Phoenix, or they were just some mathematical notations to demonstrate various dom domains. Because uh, again, to me, that was a, a very complicated model that you have nine different domains probably being labeled in the original mesh and then imported into the Phoenix script. So how, how do you handle this? Uh, well, I don't know whether we need all of these domains and so on. I just know that uh, at least for the models that uh, we have now that are sort of simpler than, than what we proposed there, then we don't really get uh, uh, a complete picture of what is happening. It's not like crazy wrong either. I must uh, admit that. So it's we're not like far into the woods. We are out of the woods and we try to figure out the, the, the details sort of. So, but uh, definitely there are some issues in the details, but this like I, if, I, if I want to have one compartment that is viscous, one that is pore elastic, another one that is viscous and so on, right? I, and even if I want this to be in many simulations, it's not just one. I want this to be a part of many simulations. Then I have to have a segmentation system that already from the start export all of this uh, information stores it in a place where I can take it in and, and work on further. So in uh, in uh, in FreeSurfer, you have thousands of domains that are marked, or perhaps not thousands, but at least several hundreds. And they can, they, they, they are various things. And, and you can even include more compartments than, than that if you include more modalities and so on. So, I don't know exactly how many domains we need, but of course, if I just say that I have a bunch of domains and I, for this type of domain, let's say I label it nine, I will have this equation for uh, label uh, six. I will have this equation for the interface between six and nine. I have this condition, then I can uh, deal with this as long as I have all of the labels there right this is just dx uh, yeah. of something or ds of something in, in fairness so it's at least possible to include all of this uh, and frankly in my mind well even though it's more complicated to write out all of these equations for all of the different domains it's not like uh, conceptually any harder. It's just that there are different uh, equations living uh, at different places, but I can solve the whole, I want to solve everything inside of this bucket, right? This is my goal. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So thank you so much. And yes, time yeah. is over. So I think we can close the session now. So I would like to thank you very much, Mostaba, for joining us today. And also thank you so much, Kent, for this very fascinating uh, talk and the interesting discussion. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and having, having me present my work. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.